My name is Mona Kumar. I'm a neurointensivist and director of the neuro ICU at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and today my talk is entitled Optimizing Care for Patients with Status Epilepticus. So I have no disclosures um, except for the fact that um, my mom had a seizure uh, and went into status actually a couple years ago. And so I feel like um, this particular topic is is particularly near and dear to my heart, um, and I've seen things from both sides. So, um, so that'll be all that I say about my personal experience. Um, but I think, um, obviously, this is something that can be very concerning to patients and their families. And so, um, let's get started. We'll speak mostly about generalized convulsive status epilepticus today. Um, I have arranged the talk to some extent in the kind of pre-hospital emergency department ICU framework, but really this is um, going to focus on treatments in the first hour of managing these patients. Uh, I've kind of called it the golden hour and my um, hourglass there has sort of gold sand in it uh, because really the crux of management is that first hour. And so we'll talk briefly about stabilization and then first line treatments, second line treatments, and third line treatments. Um, we'll review the PEN protocol uh, for status epilepticus um, and then uh, summarize our findings. So for those of you that uh, stayed up late uh, watching the inauguration and uh, fireworks with Katy Perry, I thought, you might be a little tired before uh, but this late morning before lunch. So I'll put the um, kind of summary slide up at the front. Um, fundamentally, I think what I want you to take away from this talk is that time is brain. Um, don't wait for an EEG to treat seizures. Um, treat seizures, treat them fast, and abort them with um, benzodiazepines. Um, use algorithms. There are a lot of published guidelines, but um, algorithms that really have buy-in from pharmacy um, and others really can improve time to treatment, which is critical. Um, and they can also help to avoid underdosing of medications. There's a lot of medications at your disposal and remembering all of those um, dosages can be difficult, um, but making sure that you use the right and optimized um, doses can be crucial to managing these patients. So we'll start with epidemiology. Um, acute seizures comprise about 1% of all ED visits. Um, so we'll talk about seizures for a moment. Seizures are defined as transient occurrences of signs and symptoms uh, related to abnormal synchronous neuronal activity. So basically the brain um, fires synchronously, which it shouldn't do, um, and that leads to a host of signs and symptoms, and that is a seizure. Um, the manifestation of these seizures um, really are protean. Um, most seizures are identified by their motor symptoms, especially the clonic jerking. Uh, these are called convulsive seizures. Um, but truthfully, most seizures do not have a convulsive component. Um, seizures that don't have a prominent motor component are con uh, considered non-convulsive. Um, and in the ambulatory setting, seizures usually last about less than three minutes. Um, and they're usually self-limited. Uh, but seizures that present to the emergency department typically last longer. And of the seizures that occur in the emergency department, 6% will progress to status epilepticus. But only a quarter of those patients have known epilepsy. And interestingly, 10 to 30% of status is the initial seizure presentation um, for these patients. There is a bimodal distribution where status occurs more frequently and commonly in the very young, under one year of age, um, and in the elderly over 60 years of age. Generalized convulsive status epilepticus is a very common neurologic emergency. Uh, it obviously requires prompt evaluation and treatment, and this is what we're gonna be focused on um, for most of the talk, as I said. Historically, Status epilepticus was defined as one single seizure lasting more than 30 minutes or two convulsive seizures over a period of 30 minutes without recovery of consciousness in between. 
waiting 30 minutes to make a diagnosis of status is just not practical or appropriate at this time. So the working definition um, for most ED physicians and neurologists are persistent convulsive seizures of five minutes or more, or two discrete seizures without complete recovery of consciousness within a five minute period. Non-convulsive status um, is a little bit harder to define and it usually needs an EEG to identify, but it's a patient with impaired consciousness for about 30 to 60 minutes with some form of seizure activity on EEG. And so you can describe status by whether it affects the whole part of the brain or the whole brain, which is generalized, or a part of the brain, which would be um, partial. Um, you can describe status whether it's using motor um, components, so it's convulsive, or where it does not, non-convulsive. You can categorize status based on the type of discharges that you see, whether they are generalized discharges or they are uh, localized discharges, or whether that phenotype produces myoclonic jerking or just a loss of consciousness. Um, so there's many different ways to categorize status. Um, we're really going to be talking about primary and secondary generalized convulsive status in this talk. Um, but examples of non-convulsive status include um, abson status, spike wave stupor, um, EPC or epilepsia partialis continua, where you might have focal motor movements in a patient who's wide awake, but those could be continuous. So we're going to jump right into um, to focusing on treatment. So in the first five minutes, you really want to make sure that you're stabilizing the patient. And so um, when we think about status treatment, we divide it into phases. So the first phase would be assessment and stabilization. Next would be administration of first line therapies, then second line therapies and third line therapies. Third line therapies are generally anesthetic infusions. When we're talking about assessment and stabilization, often this typically occurs in the field. And so there, a rapid neurologic and medical assessment should be performed with concurrent with ABCs. Patients should be moved to their left side. Any debris in their mouth should be removed. Um, their airway should be assessed. If supplemental oxygen is available and needed, that should be considered. Um, really airway is critical here. So bag mask um, ventilation or securing an airway, monitoring um, heart rate and blood pressure are crucial, getting um, blood glucose assessments, um, and really then getting first line therapy in, which would be benzodiazepines, um, occurs in that first five minutes. In terms of which agent um, if there's a functioning IV, generally treatment is with lorazepam, either at 0.1 milligrams per kilogram or at a fixed dose of four milligrams. Alternatively, if there's no IV access, then 10 milligrams of IM midazolam or rectal diazepam can be administered. So I know what you're asking. Is there data to support this? And there is. Um, so basically, um, in one randomized control trial of about 200 patients with status, um, it was determined that tr seizures terminated with either lorazepam or diazepam when compared to placebo. So compared to no treatment, benzodiazepines definitely st uh, terminate status quickly. In terms of which benzo is preferable, um, in a randomized control trial in 2001, um, 10 milligrams of IM midazolam was compared to four milligrams of IV lorazepam. And what they noticed is actually that the midazolam in the field was superior. Um, but that was because the IM route decreased time to administration. But if they actually looked at the time to aborting the seizure with the medication itself, IV lorazepam terminated seizures more quickly once it was infused. So the efficacy in some ways of IV lorazepam is, is faster, um, but avoiding putting an IV in the first place decreases time to administration. 
In the pediatric population, IM midazolam has been found to be more effective than IV diazepam. And so when we get to the ED, what happens next? So once in the emergency department, continue um, ABCs, and now we're going to consider intubation um, if that's necessary. So you can choose preferably an induction agent that has anti-seizure properties, um, such as propofol or midazolam. You want to make sure to use the shortest acting paralytic possible because the convulsions may stop with the paralysis, but the seizure activity in the brain is obviously not stopping. So being able to identify the convulsive component um, just helps us identify without an EEG that um, the convulsions are ongoing. But sometimes when you're masked to the motor movement, um, you don't realize that the patient's still having seizures. Hemodynamic and respiratory monitoring is critical. Um, especially since many of the medications that are administered have hemodynamic impact. And so making sure that that monitoring is um, started is important. In terms of laboratory data, basic labs with toxicology screens and ideally anti-seizure drug levels can be very helpful in management. Um, obviously, continue to check blood glucose and administer thiamine. This is particularly important in the um, patient who is having seizures and is unknown to the team um, because these patients may be um, at risk for Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Um, and so it's important that thiamine be administered. Next, you wanna consider um, evaluating the underlying etiology. And so consideration of a CT scan of the head and or lumbar puncture is critical at this time. And so why is that? It's important to obtain a head CT or get an LP because when it comes to status, there's a high likelihood that an acute cause is triggering it. When you think about acute seizures, about a third of them occur because of an acute event. A third of them because of some remote or progressive event and about a third of them are from a patient's inherent um, idiopathic epilepsy syndrome. But in status, that's very different. Nearly two thirds of patients with status are in status from an acute etiology. A third, a little more than 20, 25% um, are in status because of a remote problem, like an old stroke, um, and only a very small percentage have underlying epilepsy as the cause of status. Um, and when these patients are in the ICU, um, nearly all of them um, have an underlying problem. And so what are those problems? So when I say an acute symptomatic event, this is typically an acute stroke, a hemorrhage, um, could be venous sinus thrombosis, a brain infection like meningitis or encephalitis, um, a new onset tumor diagnosis. Um, these are things that can trigger acute symptomatic, um, acute, can trigger status. These are the acute symptomatic um, features of that. The progressive symptomatic um, etiologies are more like known tumors, um, maybe underlying disease like metabolic dysfunction, diabetes, DKA. Um, or a degenerative problem like Alzheimer's disease. More commonly, you can see from remote symptomatic um, injury, like prior TBI, prior stroke, um, prior perinatal insults. Um, and it's very rare that idiopathic epilepsies um, result in um, status in the ICU often. So we discussed the pre-hospital treatment of seizures that may evolve into status. Um, in terms of first-line agents, um, benzodiazepines were established as being the first-line agents um, also through the VA cooperative study. This was a study performed in 1998, and it compared four treatment regimens, um, lorazepam, monotherapy, weight-based, dilantin, weight-based, 
phenobarbital monotherapy weight-based and the combination of diazepam and dilantin. And what they found was that in patients who had clear convulsive status, so a subset of the 570 is about 384 patients, lorazepam monotherapy was more successful in terminating seizures within 20 minutes than any of the other agents. So lorazepam aborted seizures in about two thirds of patients. Phenobarbital alone was about 60% of patients, which was similar to the combination of diazepam and, and dilantin. But dilantin monotherapy was really um, much less successful in termination. And so these first line therapies have class one data supporting their use. Um, benzodiazepines are generally considered abortive medications. Um, they are all generally weight-based and can be administered via the intraosseous route if needed. Lorazepam is generally the drug of choice and we'll talk about why. The time to onset is very short, it's about less than two minutes, but the duration of action is longer. It's about four to 12 hours, which is longer than diazepam. It can be administered either as the weight-based dose, the 0.1 mix per keg, or at a fixed dose, four milligrams, which makes it a lot easier to remember. Um, the max infusion rate is about two milligrams per minute, um, so you can get those four milligrams in, um, in a two-minute uh, period. Um, but it's not as stable in um, liquid form or at ambient temperatures, and so it's not used as much in the field because of that. Diazepam, on the other hand, um, has a very rapid onset of action. It actually, its onset is faster than um, lorazepam's at 10 to 20 seconds. Um, the problem with it is that um, its high lipid solubility actually um, rapidly penetrates the central nervous system, but then it also is cleared out pretty quickly. So within 20 minutes, um, the effect may be lost. And so because of that, it's not um, the ideal agent. So even though it's great at aborting seizures, uh, if you don't chase it with something quickly, uh, seizures could recur. Midazolam is also very effective at terminating seizures. It has a very rapid onset time, um, but it also has a rapid clearance. However, it's very stable at ambient temperatures, and so it's preferred um, for use in the field. In addition to the IV dose, you can actually administer midazolam as a one-time 10 milligram IM injection. Uh, it's also available intranasally um, and um, as a buccal administrated uh, medication or administered medication. Um, but since the half-life of many of these medications is short, it's critical that as you're giving the first line agents you're preparing to give the second line agent. Um, so following this step, you need to be thinking about the next step, which would be your second line agents. So are there data um, regarding second line agents? Um, as of 2019, there are. Um, so the ESET trial um, looked at Keppra, Phosphenatoin, uh, and Depakote and compared the three uh, in, in terms of seizure cessation. Unfortunately, the trial was stopped early. And uh, what you're looking at here is um, patients with treatment success. And the three curves are almost identical because um, they pretty much all reduce seizures um, about 47, 45 to 47% of the time. And so um, there really wasn't much of a difference between the groups. The main thing was that um, maybe their side effect profiles were a little bit different, but since it wasn't really powered, um, since they stopped the trial due to futility, um, the differences in, in side effects were really not significant. Um, and so essentially they're all considered equivalent. All right, so let's talk about uh, these agents in a little more depth. Um, so Keppra, regarding um, these second line agents, levetiracetam or Keppra is uh, a good option. It has minimal side effects and really no significant drug-drug interactions. I would say the main point I wanna make about levetiracetam is that it is underdosed. 
Um, so you see here that the loading dose is three to four and a half grams. Um, if, if we were in person, I'd like to see how many people have ever administered doses that high. Uh, generally, people don't give the doses that high. And these are the doses that are recommended in the American Epilepsy Society and the Neurocritical Care Society guidelines. Um, it really is safe to do that and can abort um, or can um, minimize seizures um, propagation, you know, if, if given uh, at these doses early. And there's really no downside to doing it. There's no significant drug-drug interactions. And even at these high doses, there's really minimal side effects. So um, we encourage um, use of the weight-based dosing. So either 600 mg per kilo um, or a three gram load or even a, um, up to a four and a half gram load. In terms of Depakote, um, Depakote is a great anti-seizure medication. Um, it really, it's considered a broad spectrum uh, anti-seizure med, which basically means that it's good for all types of epilepsy, whether they're generalized or partial. Um, it is non-sedating. And so it really is one that, um, that epileptologists really like. Um, obviously the main concerns about valproic acid are the drug-drug interactions. Um, they, you have to use caution with enzyme inducers and it can um, increase free levels of other seizure medications that are given. Um, and then it has a lot of side effects in terms of possible hepatotoxicity and hyperaminemia, um, can also induce a thrombocytopenia. Um, however, when these, when it's used in short courses to, um, to help avoid status, um, usually it's tolerated pretty well. Um, again, the dose here is 30 milligrams per kilogram. You might remember it as more like 20 milligrams per kilogram, um, but you really can push um, the load up higher to, um, to get that effect um, that you want. Phosphenatoin is another option. The dose is 20 milligrams per kilogram of phenytoin equivalents. Um, it can be infused two to three times faster than regular Dilantin. Um, Phosphenny is a prodrug of Dilantin. Um, what's important to know about it is that it does not precipitate. So um, Dilantin and benzodiazepines actually can't be administered through the same IV because it can precipitate, but you don't have to worry about that with uh, phosphenatoin. Uh, the, there's no propylene glycol in the diluent. So um, it can be more rapidly infused compared to Dilantin, and it causes less hypotension because of that. Um, and so you still monitor, um, you know, cardiac status, but um, but it's it's much better tolerated with fewer cardiovascular side effects than uh, Dilantin. Um, and you can even administer it IM. I have um, Dilantin listed here for you. Um, we at Penn actually don't have phosphenatoin, so we. Um, we do have phenytoin as part of our um, algorithm. Um, however, you know the main reason it's there is um, one to demonstrate that the infusion rate is so much um, slower than phosphenny, and two um, to remind people that underdosing of this medication is also common. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for people to say, "Oh, one gram of Dilantin," but it really is 20 mg per kg, and so for a 70 kilogram person, that really should be 1,400 milligrams, um, which is quite different than than just the one gram. Um, and then, lastly, um, it's important to recognize that with phosphenatoin administration, you can get the dreaded um, purple glove syndrome. Um, this can be an absolute catastrophe. Um, where the infusion of the medication causes um, essentially ultimate um, uh, blistering and necrosis of the hand, and it often uh, results in limb loss. All right, so if patients fail first and second line therapy, um, they are considered to be in refractory status epilepticus. And this occurs about 20 to 30 percent of all generalized convulsive status. Um, if when the third line agent, which is IV anesthetics, um, are weaned and seizures recur, that is called malignant refractory status epilepticus. And if that persists for five days, um, that is 
considered super refractory status epilepticus. Um, I, I swear that's actually a medical term. Um, so clearly getting ahead of status at the beginning is crucial. Um, what is the likelihood of this happening? So in a prospective study of about 164 patients, um, about 50% um, had no further evidence of seizures after first and second, ther second line therapy. And in that group, mortality was about 13%. But in those patients who had persistent um, evidence of electrographic seizures or very subtle signs of, of um, convulsive seizures like eyelid twitching or lip twitching, um, mortality was much higher. It was between 30 and 50%. So um, it's important to have EEG monitoring um, after at least second line therapy to make sure that um, we can document that there's either no further evidence of seizures or um, that there's further evidence that's not clearly um, evident on clinical exam. And so certainly by the time the diagnosis of refractory status is made, um, coming back to determining what the underlying etiology is, is critical. And so a repeat, more extensive neurologic exam, um, consideration of an MRI, and certainly a lumbar puncture is indicated. So I'll digress for a moment and talk about pathophysiology. Um, so seizures generally result from two things, either decreased inhibition of abnormal activity or increased excitation leading to abnormal activity. So at the beginning of seizures, there can be failure of inhibition. And so increasing GABAergic responses um, is prioritized since GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Um, but over time, these GABA receptors are endocytosed and there's increased NMDA reg upregulation. And so you start to see um, kind of changes in the um, kind of cell, cell surface markers and, and structure. And that um, synaptic plasticity may result in decreased sensitivity to GABAergic medications. And then by the time status is um, established, you will also get altered gene expression, um, and then you'll have different transporters. Um, and this is where you start to see proteins that actually induce drug resistance. And so your GABA, um, at this point, your GABA unresponsive. And so you may need to change um, the type of medications that you are, um, tar or the, the receptors that you're targeting, because now your GABAergic medications might not be as um, successful. And so over that time of progression, you have an acute seizure um, at the left-hand side, which is still GABA responsive. So you want to be aggressive here with your GABAergic medications, um, but a seizure that lasts more than 10 minutes will likely present uh, progress into status. And once you get into status, about 50% of those patients um, will continue to have electrographic seizures after um, the convulsion stop. And that's the refractory status. And then of those refractory status patients, 30% um, of them will go um, into malignant status epilepticus, which is recurrence of, of seizures after the anesthetic taper. So um, this is pretty critical that we that we target the medications to the receptors that are active because it also impacts mortality. So you can see here on the bottom left hand of the screen, one acute seizure of less than two minutes in duration has a mortality of less than 1%. But as time progresses um, to the 10 hour mark, uh, mortality is now at 40%. And if it persists even further than that, it can be as high as 60%. So although what I said there sort of intimates that the neuronal changes may be what's resulting in the um, mortality risk and that seizures do increase glutamate and glycerol and anaerobic metabolism and can uh, liberate uh, neuron-specific enolase from um, apoptotic uh, neurons, and this might cause increased intracranial pressure, and there's clear neuronal damage in the hippocampus and neocortex, 
the mortality from status is really not from the neurologic changes or the or the pathologic changes to the brain. Uh, the mortality from status is really due to the underlying medical conditions, um, the patient's age, the etiology that triggered the status, and the patient's comorbidities. So um, at baseline, someone's first episode, uh, kind of a young, otherwise healthy person's first episode of status, the mortality may be between 15 and 20 percent. But in the elderly, that becomes more like 40 to 70 percent. And if it's associated with cardiac arrest being the underlying etiology, the mortality is more like 75 to 80 percent. So you can see that it really has to do largely with the medical comorbidities of the patient. Um, and also, I would say the intensity of critical care um, that these patients require. So the longer these patients are on mechanical ventilation, the longer um, they're exposed to medications that might cause um, infection or adynamic ileus or DVTs, um, that can also really impact mortality. There are some scoring systems that have been developed to, um, to sort of categorize and classify um, seizure uh, status severity. And so the STESS score uh, is a six point scale that accounts for the contribution of level of consciousness, worst seizure type, patient age dichotomized at 65, um, and history of pre previous seizures uh, with a history of seizures being protective. Um, that is a six point scale. And if the score is less than two, um, then the vast majority of patients um, um, remain um, alive. So 97% survival. Um, a score of three to six, survival drops to about 60%. Um, so that can be one way to, to think about um, overall mortality in these patients. All right, so we've spoken about refractory status and um, what are the third line agents uh, geared to treat this subpopulation of status patients? So first we'll discuss midazolam. Um, so it is GABAergic. So in the early treatments, if midazolam infusions are started early, um, it can really be um, successful. Uh, it is relatively well tolerated. Um, and what's advantageous about midazolam um, and propofol, which we'll get to, um, compared to something like pentobarbital, is that because it has a relatively short half-life, if seizures are aborted quickly and the midazolam can be weaned off, patients can be um, you know, ostensibly extubated more quickly and can, um, can minimize the total time of critical care. Um, the dose is important to, um, to point out. So the IV loading dose um, is, well, you can start at 0.2 mg per keg, and you can rapidly up titrate that every five minutes. Um, on the one column, it says to a max of two mg per kilo, but really the um, infusion rate has been um, suggested to go as high as three milligrams per kilo per hour. Um, so just to make sure that you're reading that right, yes, a 70 kilogram person could theoretically be on 210 milligrams um, of midazolam per hour. Um, and we certainly have used high doses and we advocate that higher dose, uh, you know, appropriate weight-based high dosing be um, kind of up titrated quickly to gain um, control of seizures early instead of um, delayed because the goal is not to be on these medications for a prolonged infusion, um, but to get quick control, um, ensure durability of that control, and then wean the patient off. Propofol um, is another agent that's um, very well tolerated in general, can also be quickly up titrated. Um, you can use it two milligrams per kilo every five minutes to a max of 10 milligrams per kilo. Um, now, if you're using higher doses, so if you're using doses that are greater than five milligrams per kilo per hour, um, the risk of propofol infusion syndrome goes up and um, 
especially in patients who are young, you may want to cap the duration um, that you are on high doses of propofol to avoid that syndrome. Um, that syndrome includes hypotension, um, bradycardia, um, rhabdomyolysis, uh, metabolic lactic acidosis, and renal failure. And so once it starts, it's very difficult to turn around um, and you have to recognize that um, it's likely the propofol that's causing it and not some intercurrent infection. Um, it's often hard to do that when patients are critically ill. Um, but again, it is very um, quick to turn off. And so if you get ready control of the status early, um, you could theoretically be off um, your third line agent within 24 or 48 hours, and then um, patients can recover their level of consciousness and ostensibly be extubated. That's in kind of contradistinction to pentobarbital, which is more effective in terminating seizures than either midazolam or propofol. Um, it very quickly can, um, can decrease the rate of breakthrough seizure. So one study demonstrated that the rate of breakthrough seizures with pentobarbital was 12%, um, whereas with propofol and midazolam, it was 42%. Um, but it does come at a cost, and that cost is um, in hypotension. So nearly twice as many patients had hypotension on pentobarbital than on either midaz or propofol. Um, and it certainly increases mechanical ventilator days because um, the half-life is so long, it's 15 to 60 hours. And the longer you're on pentobarbital, the more accumulation you often have with the medication. Um, and I will tell you that um, it's a cardiac depressant, it's a respiratory depressant, it's an immune depressant, it's a GI depressant. It really stops everything um, from, from moving. And so we've had such um, complications with um, a dynamic ileus that we've almost had to stop using it completely because um, the medical complications from its use um, make it they almost prohibit it from its uh, routine use in our ICU. Ketamine is an interesting medication in that it's an NMDA antagonist. So as those GABAergic um, receptors are being endocytosed and, and NMDA are being upregulated, um, this might be a favorable medicine to consider, uh, especially if patients are um, refractory to midazolam and propofol to start. Um, you can uptitrate it pretty quickly. Um, and we some places use a max of four and a half milligrams per kilo. We've pushed that to almost 10 milligrams per kilo, and we've had some good success um, with it as an agent. It's also um, hemodynamically neutral, so it often um, allows us to come off um, vasopressor agents, um, which can be you know, just one less um, critical care um, burden that you need to carry. Um, and so, there's not as much data on ketamine, but we found it to be um, very titrate, uh, very um, effective. As you're on the third line agents, you may consider um, use of adjunctive agents as well. Um, so at this point, you may be on one, two, or three um, non-IV titratable um, infusion. Um, you might be on Keppra, Depakote, um, maybe other agents. And so if you're thinking about what you can use at this point, um, phenobarbital is often very um, successful in helping keep um, breakthrough seizures from coming through. The bolus also is often very effective. And sometimes you can get by with using the bolus and the IV infusion of the other anesthetics uh, without having to maintain um, on phenobarbital. Um, so I find it to be very effective. Um, it does induce more hypotension and respiratory depression. It also has a very prolonged half-life. So um, it may result in patients having a lower time, a slower time to, um, to wake up after seizure control has been achieved. Um, because of that, uh, we start to favor lecosamide um, you can give it as a two to 400 milligram IV bolus. Um, 
And so it's pretty well tolerated. Um, there are occasional uh, concerns um, for heart block. And so we always screen patients with an EKG at the beginning to look for PR prolongation and a history of, um, of cardiac disease. Um, but we tend to go to lacosamide um, relatively quickly. Um, it also helps um, the EEG. Um, topiramate has been used in the literature successfully, um, but it's an orally administered medication. So, um, and it, the doses um, are not the doses that are used for maintenance. So for um, status, uh, it is 1600 milligrams per day, which is a pretty whopping dose. Um, and I would caution you about using topiramate when you're also using propofol, because since propofol can cause a metabolic acidosis, um, topiramate can also cause um, a metabolic acidosis. And so um, that could uh, cause particular problems in combination. Um, Clobazam is um, a newer agent that, um, that we are using a lot in the ICU. It is a benzodiazepine. It has an onset of action um, between uh, lorazepam and diazepam, um, so pretty fast. Um, it can be uptitrated pretty quickly as well. Um, and there are a fair number of patients who are on clobazam um, as an outpatient. So although it is sedating, it's considered a little less sedating than phenobarbital. Um, and it helps us achieve uh, kind of seizure control um, in the kind of malignant status state. All right, so in the last, I think, 10 minutes, um, I wanna talk about the approach to treatment. Um, so really the goals of treatment here are to stop seizures as fast as possible. Um, seizures beget seizures. So the longer you're seizing, the longer you're seizing. Um, so creating protocols based on the published algorithms and guidelines can be critical um, to improving the care and stopping seizures quickly. Um, it's also important that you identify the underlying pathology that may be triggering the status and that you treat that as much as possible. So if a patient is in status because of meningitis, getting the LP results and starting the antimicrobials um, becomes crucial. Um, like I said, you know, the, I think that in my mind, um, uh, as an ICU physician, I see the burden of long-term critical care and I worry about that. So being aggressive early to abort that need for later um, critical care, which I think does impact outcomes, um, is also very important. Um, and then if there's anything that's confusing or something that's atypical, um, always feel free to consult uh, neurology or epilepsy. So this was um, a, a figure from a paper that I thought was really, really telling. Um, if you administer, so in patients who have um, generalized status, um, if the delay in getting the first line therapy is less than 30 minutes, um, you 80% of patients um, will respond to treatment, at least in this study. If that first line therapy takes an hour, um, you're still doing pretty well, um, maybe about 75% um, response rate. But with increased time, that response rate to first line therapy goes down. And so those early delays really have an impact on whether these, whether some seizures progress into status. Um, so I think that um, it's, it's really unacceptable um, that sev up to 70% of some uh, of patients in some studies have a greater than 30 minute delay to first line therapy in a hospital. Um, and one small study implemented like a code status um, protocol and was able to reduce time to med administration from nearly an hour to 22 minutes. And so that is really kind of the fundamental tenet of why um, we created an algorithm at Penn. There are published protocols. So the American Epilepsy Society created an algorithm and ours is very similar to their algorithm um, and is based largely on this. Um, and so they really break it down in terms of zero to five minutes to stabilize the patient, five to 20 minutes to get the initial benzodiazepine in the patient. Um, they list that the um, benzodiazepine therapy 
has level A um, data behind it, makes the recommendations for intramuscular midazolam, IV lorazepam, or IV diazepam. Um, if the patient continues to have seizures, um, they recognize that there's, at that time in 2016, there was no evidence for uh, second therapy of choice. At this point, we would say that the IV phosphenetoin, IV valproate, which is actually at a higher infusion rate or, or higher um, baseline loading dose, 40 mg per kilo than I mentioned um, before, and IV um, Keppra at 60 milligrams, which is the dose that I mentioned before, um, are essentially all equivalent now. That's the um, updated data. And so it still holds. Um, they also say that you could consider IV phenobarbital um, as a, a level B recommendation. And then if patients are still having seizures after that, um, now you're in the third phase treatment and they make recommendations of either thiopental, which is not available in the US, midazolam, pentobarbital, or propofol. The Neurocritical Care Society published um, guidelines for non-convulsive status back in 2012. They are due for an update. Um, they similarly make recommendations of what should happen immediately in the first two minutes, in the first five minutes, in the first 10 minutes, and then more urgently um, in 10 minutes, 60 minutes, um, 15 minutes. And so the PEN pathway um, was really defined because of this delay to first line therapy in up to almost 80% of some patients. Um, the published guidelines recognize that adherence to these published protocols occurs in only a quarter of patients. Um, and as I've mentioned, there's significant underdosing of medications, including Ativan, Keppra, Dilantin. And so we created a pragmatic flowchart for status um, to really standardize practice across our health system. And so it starts with the definition of status. So we use, um, you know, five minutes as our um, indication for moving forward. If there's not, if there are no convulsions, um, then there's a comment for non-convulsive status, um, and that the recommendation is to um, get an EEG and consult neur neurology. If the diagnosis of, is convulsive status then the first goal is to stabilize the patient. Um, and this should happen within the first five minutes. So then once the patient is um, relatively stabilized, if there's IV access, then we advocate for a fixed dose of lorazepam, four milligrams, just so that you don't have to do any math. Four milligrams, you give it. And after five minutes, if the patient is still having convulsions, then we give an additional two to four milligrams. If there is no IV access, then the recommendation is 10 milligrams of I intramuscular midazolam. And we recommend that five go in at the right um, quad and um, five go in at the left quadricep. Um, there's a caveat for patients who are less than 40 kilos. And then again, after five minutes, if patients are still having convulsions, there's a recommendation to repeat administration. If seizures continue, um, then we enter second line therapy. Um, so Keppra dose is three grams over 10 minutes. Um, and so our pharmacist has, has this um, prepared. We don't have to worry about it. Again, we prefer sort of fixed dose regimens just because they're easier to think about um, and involves less um, potential error. Um, we recommend neurology consultation at this time. Um, if the patient's already on um, Keppra or um, there's a reason why a different agent may be preferred, um, we recommend Depakote at the 40 milligram per kilo loading dose, um, but we also have Dilantin written into the protocol. So, if the patient continues to have seizures after first and second line therapy, then we recommend intubation um, and initiation of third line therapy with midazolam. 
So at that point, we actually do a 10 milligram midazolam IV load, and we start the midazolam infusion at 10 milligrams per hour. If the patient is having clinical seizures after that, um, we do a 10 milligram bolus and increase of the infusion by 10 milligrams. Um, and we just keep doing that and we titrate up to a maximum of two milligrams per kilo per hour. At the same time, if, um, if seizures have stopped, then head CT is uh, requested, um, LP is considered, um, and further workup is uh, discussed with the neurology team. And then by the 60 minute mark, at this point, the EEG um, may be added um, so that we can determine whether patients are having ongoing seizures or not. Often it's complicated because once the patients are intubated, um, if they have been paralyzed, we may not be able to see the convulsive component. And so we really do rely heavily on the EEG at that point to determine whether there's ongoing seizure activity and um, how quickly we need to uptitrate the um, anesthetic infusion. So it is important to just point out that there are many medications that may lower the seizure thresholds. Um, so in the emergency department, if there's um, infection as the trigger of seizures, um, caution with uh, fluoroquinolones. Um, Demerol is a opiate that can cause um, a lowered seizure threshold. Um, overdoses, um, especially uh, bupropion um, and cocaine can cause seizures. Um, and in the in the in cocaine, caution should be used with um, dilantin use. So um, it's important to have that information um, as soon as possible. So in summary, um, seizures beget seizures. Um, patients who are seizing, if they continue to seize, will continue to seize. So we get very aggressive about treating seizures and not waiting for the EEG. It really doesn't matter to us where the, um, the focus is or what kind of epilepsy it is, or you know, it really is most important just to abort the seizure with first-line therapy that has data to support it. Um, we do think that patients who are in status need to have evaluation of the underlying condition because that really often is the target of treatment. Um, and in terms of second-line um, therapy, Kepra, Depakote, Dilantin, Phosphenitoin are all um, relatively equal. Um, just make sure that you're dosing those second line agents appropriately in the patients with status to, um, to realize the um, potential for cessation of, of status. Um, there was pretty, uh, a paucity of evidence regarding third line therapy. Um, we generally like midazolam and just up titrate that pretty quickly. Um, consideration of ketamine in later stages may be appropriate. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, there are guidelines out there. So um, there's some randomized controlled trials and awareness of those guidelines is really helpful. And you can always phone a friend. We're here um, to discuss cases um, and um, just be a sounding board as needed. And so in conclusion, um, you know, time is brain. Algorithms are your friend. Um, give big doses to avoid uh, abort seizures early. So go big or go home. And thank you.